We have with us today Jim Kuzis. He has written with Barry Posner the book The Leadership Challenge, How to Make Extraordinary Things Happen in Organizations. Jim and I were talking briefly before the show as we were shutting down all of our technology and making sure that things were on silent and the email was shut. And I said to him, in terms of his expertise and knowing how to stand on the other side of an interview, that you've been around the block a few times. And that's true both in terms of his ability to be in this interview, but also in in the Leadership Challenge. Uh, This book came out first um, a little bit more than 30 years ago, and it became, in a sense, an instant classic. And, And that's true because 30 years later now, we have the sixth edition coming up, and it is as applicable as it was back then. Uh, Jim, thank you for writing this book with Barry, and also thank you for being on the Bregman Leadership Podcast. Peter, it's a delight. It's a real pleasure to be with you. And you were speaking about technology and the use of technology in our interview. And when Barry and I wrote the first edition of the Leadership Challenge, we didn't have this technology. We didn't even have a computer or a software program that would allow us to share files. So back then, you'd have to actually give somebody a physical copy, a hard copy. Well, now, of course, we do much of our writing where we share it back and forth over this platform. The The second edition uh, of the book and the th- second book we wrote, Credibility, was actually written over the Internet using a, a program called Kermit before technology. this technology existed. Kermit was a university and uh, research center uh, platform that allowed researchers to share files back and forth. So technology is. I remember that, and if I remember correctly, this was the '80s. Now, this was the '80s. Yeah, and so we've we've uh, been using it, but you know that's part of the change in context now. Of course, for leaders now, uh, you the president of the United States can send tweets on a daily basis and impact how people feel about policy or world affairs. Which arguably is something we need to learn how to do a little bit more effectively, but we're going to leave that for (laughs) for another conversation. Let's, Let's jump into the book here, Jim, and I would love for you to just start from a credibility standpoint and from an understanding of context, briefly share the methodology that you used in coming up with the, the, the content in the leadership challenge. Well, I met Barry at Santa Clara University in 1981. We started to work together uh, that that year, and I was the director of executive education, and this tall guy comes and knocks on my door and introduces himself, and uh, we have become fast friends uh, almost since that moment. Uh, in fact, Barry and my uh, his wife, Jackie, and my wife, Tay, and I, uh, do things frequently together. Just last weekend, went to a movie together. We have dinners together. So we've remained close friends since then. But Barry and I found that we had a common interest in managerial values. And he had written a paper, a research paper with Warren Schmidt on man- how values make a difference and invited me to join them in writing up the, the re- one of the research papers. That began an exploration of that topic and then corporate culture. And we had an opportunity to present this at Santa Clara University on the second day of a two-day program. The first day was done with Tom Peters and on uh, his, in search of excellence, on organizational excellence. So Barry and I had the second day on managerial excellence. And we didn't have a book like Tom and we didn't have necessarily a methodology Yet So in the pre-work for the seminar, we asked participants to write a personal best leadership case because we wanted to explore whether or not people were doing some things in common when they were, in in this case, early on managing. And we had the assumption that you don't have to be in an excellent company to be an excellent leader. And that was kind of a breakthrough moment for us, making that, just making that assumption that not all excellent leaders are in excellent companies, that, that the context doesn't make the difference. Although and I'm so, kind of curious whether there's a correlation 
between the number of excellent leaders in a company and the excellence of that company, that ultimately leadership excellence should lead to company excellence. Have you found that? Yes. So that is true. That is very much true. Uh, in fact, in our data, if you take a look at our data, in organizations where if you take our scale, uh, we developed an, then an assessment instrument after we had done the case studies and developed the model. We developed an assessment tool. That assessment tool has a one to 10 scale. Those individuals at the bottom end of the scale who essentially get scores of one or two on the frequency with which they use leadership practices have only about a 4% level of engagement among employees, whereas those who score in 9, 10 at the high end of the scale, the top 20% score uh, having 95.8% rate of high engagement among employees. So yes, it's absolutely true. The, so the more leaders there are who engage more frequently in leadership practices, the higher the engagement, the higher the performance, profitability, lower the turnover, higher the quality, et cetera. So these and these, what you've done is you've reduced it in effect to five practices, right? So, yes. so when you're looking at this leadership practices inventory, you're assessing, as I'm understanding it, um, people's demonstration of these five practices and and the um, ones who are rated as frequently using these five. Those are the ones who have a ninety five percent highly engaged direct report. Uh, cohort, and then the ones who rarely use these five are the ones who are more in the four percent, which is such a massive distinction, Dude. such a such a gap. Twenty two point eight times. Right. Twenty two point eight times. It's amazing. Difference. Amazing. So yeah. Give us a quick and dirty. And oh, actually, before I say that, um, you've administered this leadership practices inventory to three million people. Is that am I correct in that? We've, we've, we've administered it to 5 million. We've analyzed data from 3 million. Our current database is about 1.2. So we use the most current respondents, but the, the database itself is 5 million total. 3 million have gone through some rigorous psychometric testing, and this is where we get the data that I just shared with you. So with those 3 million, you are also the, – the psychometric data that you have includes – in effect, 360s from their direct reports. Yes, correct. So the leadership practices inventory is the tool we use to measure effectiveness. And we both use it in research. Over 700 research studies have been done using that instrument. Uh, and we also use it as an assessment tool. So leaders get the feedback from that instrument to help them develop their own goals for uh, growth and development as leaders. Okay, so you've convinced me that there's some credibility to this model. Let's, let's, uh, let's look at the five practices. Could you give us a very quick, you know, brief, dirty synopsis of each of the five so that people have a sense of context? And certainly the book has a tremendous amount of depth and, and examples of it. Let's get the big picture. So we'll do the four-minute version. Four-minute, perfect. <laughs> That's... Uh, the, the first of those five practices is what we call model the way. So when we ask people, what do you do when you're at your best as a leader? Tell us, give us, tell us a story about one example. People say that one of the things they do is model the way. They are clear about what they believe in. They, they clarify their personal values and they strive to uh, reach consensus on shared values within the organization. They set the example they align their own personal leadership practices, what they do with the values that are shared by the organization. The second thing leaders do is they inspire a shared vision. Out of this uh, case examples and then the testing that we did, it's clear that leaders have, they envision the future. They have a, an ennobling and uplifting picture of what the future can be like, and then they enlist others in it. Uh, uh, but it's not just their vision of the future, it's a shared vision of the future. The third thing leaders do is they challenge the process. They search for opportunities to grow, to innovate, to improve, and then they experiment with new ideas 
try them out. They don't always work, so they have to learn from those experiences. The fourth of the practices that emerged from our studies was what we call enable others to act. Leaders foster collaboration uh, by, by building trust and teams, and then they strengthen individuals by building their competence and their confidence to do their work. And the fifth of the practices, uh, in terms of how we talk about it, not necessarily the fifth in terms of importance, is what we call encourage the heart. Leaders recognize individuals for their contributions to the values, the vision, and the goals of the organization. And then they celebrate the, the values and the victories uh, with the teams who perform the work. So those are the five, model, inspire, challenge, enable, and encourage. I love it. Thank you. And that was, I think, maybe even less than four minutes. Maybe it was like two and a half minutes. So Jim, you did a great job here. Um, as I listen to you, I mean, I've read the book, and as I listen to you, um, it makes so much sense when you think of um, just even even uh, if you step out uh, from you know a thirty thousand foot view, and you say they've got to have they've got to be have a foundation of strength in themselves. They need to see where they're going. They need to challenge everything that's getting in the way. They need to help other people rise to the occasion to support them and they have to recognize in a human way those people who are doing it. It's a, it's a satisfying and clear picture of how we have to show up. Well, thank you. That's a great summary. How come so many of us fall short? That's my, my, my underlying question, which is, you know, it's this gap between what we do and what we know. And when I, I mean, I think of myself included, you know, when I think of my company and I think it's so clear, I need to stand strongly in myself. I need to have a clear vision of where I'm headed. I need to challenge what's in the way, support other people in, in getting there and, 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 and celebrate them. It seems so simple. And yet, you know, I don't know what percentage, in fact, I should ask you that, what percentage of the 3 million are actually in that category of, you know, engaging their workforce to the tune of 95% and, and really demonstrating frequently? Do you have a number in terms of the percentage? Well, I do, but l let me just say that it is a lot easier to write about it than it is to practice it. <laughs> so Thank you for your hundred. honesty on that, because I, I struggle with it myself too. And the book's been around for a while and is celebrated as a, you know, as a fantastic and clear description of what it takes. I think leadership is an aspiration, and that's something for all leaders to keep in mind. We are never doing everything as well as we should be doing it, uh, and so we always must aspire. It's like any athlete who performs. If you, you watch the uh, – uh, we love basketball here in the Golden State with the Golden State Warriors, and so we're watching basketball all the time. They interview the players afterwards, and, and they they may have won the game, but they say, you know, but we have to do better – at uh, not turning the ball over, or I wasn't as good at making shots. And so they're, they're, they're never satisfied with how well they're doing. It's the same for exceptional leaders. To answer your question, uh, if you ask people, in fact, the, the most common question we get, what, well, what do you think it is? What do you think is the most frequently asked question we get from the people we speak to uh, in, or do seminars with? What do you think is the most frequently asked question? Um, I mean, they would probably, I mean, I imagine some degree it's, it's self-referential and how am I doing, but, but it's, you know, I, I, I would, what I would hope it would be is how do I close the gap? But I have a feeling it's not that. Uh, the, the most frequently asked question we get is are leaders born or made? Oh, that's interesting. I and guess having read your book, I, I didn't even think about that because I know your, yeah. your view is, is so clear on this. Well, uh, yes, and, and then as you know, we, we, we have an answer to that question after being asked it so often, and that is we've never met a leader who was not born. <laughs> 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 all, all leaders are born, so all people are born. Right. You know, whether you're an accountant, an engineer, or, or, or a leader, it doesn't matter. We're all born. So the real question is, what do you do with what capabilities you have before you die? Jim, I, I, I wrote a quote down um, that I'm going to just read back to you. This is reading you to you. Uh, it's from page 302. Here's the rub. Leadership can be learned. However, not everybody wants to learn it. Yes. And I think that is the first, the first two steps in this process 
of learning leadership are you have to believe you can, first of all. And the question of are leaders born or made implies that there's some element of it. People still have some sense of maybe I don't have what it takes to be a leader. In our research, we found that the number of people at the low end who score at that lowest possible score is 0.00013%. There's very few people who have only 4% of their direct reports engaged. Yeah, that's right. Those are the people at the low end. So if you combine the score of one and two, it'd be a little bit more than that. But the point of that number is to communicate to people that you do have the capability. In fact, you're already doing it. Right. It's just not doing it frequently enough. And that's an important message for people to start out with. You have to believe you can. And there are a lot of people who don't believe that they can. Mm -hmm. That's a hurdle for them to have to get over. But once you believe that, then the second thing is that you need to do for yourself is, is have aspirational goals for your leadership development, not just for your team, not just a vision of the future for the organization, but for yourself. Where do you see yourself ten year, five years from now, 10 years from now as a leader? Not in terms of a position or a role, but competence. Mm -hmm. And do you see yourself performing at a higher level than uh, in the future than you do right now? What is your ideal picture of yourself? That's an important stretch goal for all leaders to have in mind. So, And, and you've alluded, you just alluded to one of the points you make in the book, which is leadership isn't just a role, or it's better not to think of it particularly as a role, but to think of yourself as a leader, and that you you take these five characteristics and you can bring them to any level of the organization, in any role that you're in, in any task, and, and developing yourself as a leader is a job that, in your view, you know, obviously requires context for implementation, because you have to lead somewhere in some way in a particular culture with a particular group of people. But your ability to demonstrate those behaviors is agnostic of your role. Absolutely. And, and uh, that's a great word to use. In fact, that's why we include in our books cases of high school students or college students or even eight-year-olds to, to say it's not, not about your age. It's not about your gender. It's not about your position. It's not about whether you have an MBA or not or a PhD or a bachelor's degree or no degree. It's not about whether you're male or female. It's not about whether you're from one country or another country. It is a, those are all contextual elements that have to be considered when you are leading. But the importance is your behavior. Context only accounts for approximately 0.3% of why people are engaged. So here's yeah. a, an interesting question related to that. I mean, I know leaders, you know leaders, who are incredibly successful in one context. And, and I've seen this happen with someone who moves from one bank to another bank, right? From one investment, from one top five or top three investment bank in New York on Wall Street to another top three investment bank in Wall Street. And in one of them, they're a great success. And in one of them, they fail. And it's the same person. It's the same leadership characteristics. The only thing they've changed is culture and context. Yeah. How, do you, how, do you, how do you explain that? Well, if I, just to broaden that context a bit, let's say I want to go run, uh, I, I'm tasked to go to uh, Turkey and run an operation for an American company. Mm -hmm. And I go to Turkey and I immediately assume that everything in Turkey is just like it is in the United States. And all I have to do is replicate what I did here and do it over there. Uh, I'm likely to fail because the culture's different, the people are different. I'm imposing on them some assumptions about, well, what, what works where I come from should work here. So, so let, me, let, me, let me throw back at you in a, with certain language and tell me if I'm thinking about this correctly, which is, to take encouraging people, for example, great leaders, whether they're in Turkey or in New York or, you know, Goldman, Morgan, City, Merrill, wherever it is, um, they need to encourage, their, they need to celebrate. Let's talk about the, the uh, we actually, we can talk about all of them. They need to define and articulate the vision. They need to address the challenges. You know, they need to be clear in their own values. They need to... Um, 
uh, um, get the most out of people and, and enable them and empower them and they need to celebrate them. Everybody needs to do that everywhere. How you do it differs in Turkey than in the U.S. or Morgan, Goldman, Merrill, and City, right? How you approach it, the, the words you use, the way you celebrate successes, the, the, um, the, the, the manner in which you empower someone to act could be very, very different based on your context and your culture. But if you can understand and work with the context or culture, those are the underlying five find that foundational competencies or skills or characteristics that you see everybody, no matter the context, doing. Am I thinking about this correctly? Yes. So if, uh, the, the data that I described that we were, we've been talking about, that we talked about earlier, is 4% to 95%. If I do that same, if I do an analysis just of one country or even one organization in an industry and then compare that data about uh, the frequency of behavior in another like company or like country, I will find that the performance is the same. At the low end, you get low engagement at the high end, you get higher engagement. And this is universal. Uh, we've collected data from 72 different countries and the pattern is exactly the same in all countries. However, when you ask for specific examples of how do you do this in your country, the examples can be very different and distinguishable from the other. So we have to be sensitive to cultural context uh, and that's particularly true when you're talking about things like religion. Uh, if I'm working in a, in a Muslim country or a, a country where people are Hindu or Buddhist, I have to be sensitive to, those, to, to, to their, uh, their context and their cultural context. If I'm working in a country where there's uh, a different sense about how you treat elders, uh, I have to be sensitive to those issues, but I still need to make sure that I'm clear about what we believe in. I, I need to make sure I, as a leader, set a good example and I'm a role model for other people that, that we're clear about where we're headed and that other people are enlisted in that, that we are working together as a team and we trust each other, that we work to develop skills and competence and get, help people to, to be in control of their own lives and that we encourage people, we recognize them. So the practices are the same, but how, as you said, we do it can be very different. Well, and, and you've just given this beautiful um, um, uh, kind of scaffolding or, or, or process for moving into uh, from one company to another, one culture or another, which is that you leave your one context and you go into another context, and and the first thing you do is you clarify yourself. You know what are my values? What is my vision? What are the challenges? How do I empower people? Or what what in what way do I need people to be empowered? And 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 ultimately, you know, my intention to celebrate them. And then the next question you ask is, how are those five things done in this culture? And if you go from, I'm going to do these things, to answering the question, how are these things done? How is it that people are celebrated? Are they, do, do you yell from the rooftops and copy everybody? Or do you take them aside and say, hey, I just want you to know, I noticed how you spoke in that meeting and it was tremendous. And I want you to know that I was just, I was impacted by it. I noticed it and just keep doing that. Um, yeah. You know, how, how is it done in this culture and how is it? And, and then you can just take those five that you've honed and apply them to the particular context that you're in. Yes, absolutely. That's great. So do a, let's do a very, very quick case study, which is I, I have a client that I was working with and we were talking about vision and he goes, yeah, that's my problem. I don't do the vision thing. I'm really terrible at vision. I'm not, I've never been good at vision. I, I can't, I, you know, I can't do the vision thing. And, and I know um, how I approached it, but, but I'm curious to get your perspective because, you know, unlike in some ways, the other four, the vision thing is almost the hardest to yes. learn in some ways because, it's not just about you know digging deep and saying what is my values. It's about seeing a future 
that you know some people may have a hard time seeing. How do you help people to develop that? Well, you are correct. In our data, that is true. That the the practice which is scores lower compared to others consistently and over time is inspire a shared vision. It is the most challenging for people to learn and to master. And so it requires more attention. And that's the first issue. You can't learn to do it better if you initially say, well, that's not my thing. I don't do it very well. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not going to really try. You have to try. The average senior executive spends only about 3% of their work time on that question, issue. Where are we headed? Where are we going? And yet, at the very senior levels, you should be spending about 25% of your time. And so that's a big gap. And that's one of the reasons why it's so challenging for people. They don't, one, we don't spend time on it. Mm -hmm. We also don't uh, have the sense that we have this daily barrage of emails that come in and we tend to be in the present all the time. Now, it's one thing to be mindful and pay attention to how you are feeling and behaving at a particular moment in time. But leaders have to have outsight. They have to have not just insight into themselves, but outside the ability to look beyond what's currently going on. And we're not spending enough time thinking about five years from now, 10 years from now, because of all of the demands on the present that just sucks us into not paying attention to the future. And so it's important, the first step is to spend more time. The second is don't rely just on yourself. Uh, we, are, we, are, we tell people leaders have to have a vision of the future. That is true. But your vision, it doesn't have to come just from you. So the second thing you need to do as a leader is not only spend time, but talk to others about their hopes, dreams, and aspirations for the future. A technique which was borrowed initially from the insurance industry many years ago, ask uh, teams of people, so if you're, a, you're a, a manager in an organization and you want to improve your capacity to inspire a shared vision, have a process in which you assign everyone on your team to read different magazines or different newspapers or uh, watch different programs and once a month come together with one little snippet of news about where your industry is headed or where society is headed or what what's happening in education or what's happening in the arts and talk about that and then share what, what do you think the implication of this is of this technological change for our business. So we're gonna have self-driving cars in the future. What's the implication for the business that we're in? And if you have your team do that on a regular basis and talk about that over time, you will start to envision a different future. And so it's not only about yourself, you, ha you have to spend more time, but also engage your team in a conversation about where things are headed that impact your business. Jim, you remind me of why I love to do podcasts because I, you know there's so much that I get from the book and then the, the richness of having the conversation helps me to see things in a different way. And I, I so appreciate you coming on to the podcast. The book that, Jay, uh, that Jim and, and Barry have just put out, Jim Kuzis and Barry Posner, is The Leadership Challenge. It's the sixth edition of this book, originally published in the 80s, How to Make Extraordinary Things Happen in Organizations. It is clearly just as pertinent to our uh, work and leadership today as it was 30 years ago. Uh, Jim, thank you so much for being on the Bregman Leadership Podcast and for writing the book. Well, Peter, thank you very much for having me, and it's been a delight talking with you. And you remind me of why I love to do podcasts, because uh, I learn so much from you too. So thanks, so much. Thanks, thanks a million for this opportunity. Thank you.